Are we not grateful for this balanced direction regarding beards? Jehovah has dignified us. He allows each brother the freedom to choose whether or not he will wear a beard. Hey, it's okay, it's okay, you're welcome. We're not as culty as you feared. Hey, it's okay, it's okay, you're welcome. We're now gonna let you guys grow a beard. You're welcome, you're welcome. And welcome to The Attic for this special response video to the 2023 Governing Body Update number 8 video, which was released on Friday. This is now Wednesday 20th, so Friday would have been the 15th of December. It was a Christmas present from the faithful and discreet slave, a 19-minute video that was predominantly to do with this U-turn on the beard rule. Now, to be clear, it's never really been... Well, it has been put in writing, but it's not like a set-in-stone principle that you're going to die at Armageddon if you have a beard, or you're going to be disfellowshipped. It's never been that serious but it's always been a part of Jehovah's Witness culture that if you're a man and you choose to grow a beard, there will be limitations when it comes to how you get used within the organisation. I say always a part of Jehovah's Witness culture. There was obviously a time going way back in the organisation's history where beards were okay. We'll come to that. We'll come to why it suddenly became the case that beards were frowned upon. But I guess <laughs> I'm just anxious to get into this material because it is a smorgasbord of evidence that Jehovah's Witnesses are a culty, controlling organisation. It is on full display in this Governing Body Update video. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. We all want to reflect well on the God we love and worship. How do we do that? By following Bible principles. For example, consider the principle recorded at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Likewise, the women should adorn themselves in appropriate dress with modesty and soundness of mind not with styles of hair braiding and gold or pearls or very expensive clothing, but in the way that is proper for women professing devotion to God, namely through good works. Although that counsel is directed to Christian women, the principle applies equally to men and women. So one way all of us can recommend ourselves as God's ministers is by making sure that our appearance is appropriate and modest, reflecting soundness of mind. Soundness of mind is apparently what Stephen Lett is about, <laughs> if you say so. So I just found right from the get-go the use of this scripture to open the discussion very interesting and very telling. They went for 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 and 10 about appropriate dress. They couldn't produce a scripture about it being desirable for men to not have beards or preferable in any way, shape or form. Because, of course, there is no such scripture in the Bible. If anything, you can find scriptures that encourage the growing of beards. So the very fact that they had to introduce this announcement with a verse that has nothing at all to do with beards <laughs> 
tells you everything about how unscriptural the beard rule was to begin with. And I also couldn't help but find it quite hypocritical for Stephen Letts to be talking about modesty and soundness of mind in the context of styles of hair braiding and gold or pearls or very expensive clothing. Anyone who's watched any amount of JW Broadcasting will know what I'm talking about here. I mean, this is a guy who has flashed some expensive jewellery on camera in past JW Broadcasting episodes. I couldn't pick up on a pinky ring. Um, is he wearing a pinky ring? I don't... I think the pinky ring is absent <laughs> for this particular video. But he's been wearing one in the past. He's been flashing some bling in the past. Stephen Lett is also known for his tie clips. Is he wearing a tie clip? I think there is a tie clip there, but uh, probably a little bit more of a muted one. <laughs> but he's known for some, you know, quite loud, again, blingy tie clips. And he, there's also been the likes of Sam Hurd doing the JW Broadcasting flashing expensive Rolex watches. So, you know, the scripture that they've chosen, I'm not sure the governing body members as individuals even match up to the advice that's being given here. But does that mean that all of Jehovah's Witnesses make the same choices? Should we wear a uniform or adopt a single form of appropriate dress and grooming? Of course not. There are well over eight million of Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide, and we have a, a wide range of cultures. Jehovah has drawn these millions of people, and he loves variety. Variety. <laughs> That's what Jehovah loves. He loves a, a spectrum of, of different cultures and different people in his organization. Almost like a rainbow, if you will. <laughs> Speaking of which, maybe Jehovah doesn't quite like the LGBTQ plus representation in this variety. <laughs> I, I think that is total nonsense. Um... I mean, obviously, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you're going to be thinking of international conventions and the fact that at these events, Jehovah's Witnesses are allowed to show up wearing national dress. So you can have all sorts of, you know, colourful combinations showcasing this specific element of a particular country's culture. But when it comes to... Anything cultural whatsoever that disagrees with the Jehovah's Witness culture, of course there is no such thing as variety. Of course it all comes down to a uniform way of doing things. It may not be an actual uniform. It may not be a case of, as with the Mormons, wearing the, you know, the white shirt, the black tie and the badge card. But make no mistake, Jehovah's Witnesses are obsessed with appearance, always have been. They're obsessed with policing appearance and clamping down on anything that comes even close to contravening their rules when it comes to what they consider to be modest or appropriate. But now we ask, what about the wearing of a beard? Is that an appropriate choice for a brother to make? To help us answer that question, let's watch the following video, which reviews the history of beards among Jehovah's people. In patriarchal times, it was customary for men to wear beards. This practice continued among the Israelites. An Israelite man would shave only when he was humiliated or grieving. For example, when the king of Ammon humiliated David's servants by shaving their beards, 
David protected their dignity by telling them, stay in Jericho until your beards grow back and then return. Centuries later, the prophet Ezekiel shaved his beard and his head to symbolize the great distress and grief that would soon afflict Jerusalem. What about Jesus? Did he too, as an Israelite, wear a beard? For some years, based on the conclusions of certain archaeologists, our publications most often portray Jesus as clean-shaven. Based on the conclusions of some archaeologists, which, which archaeologists were jumping up and down at any point saying, Jesus didn't have a beard? <laughs> I think that is, again, just totally bogus information that is being thrust upon the Jehovah's Witness audience. Interestingly, they are going to refer to a questions from readers uh, in the Watchtower of May 1st, 1968, which they are going to give us as the point in which they started to depict Jesus with a beard. Because I'm not going to show you now, but if you actually check the organization's publications conspicuously from the Rutherford era, so from when Rutherford took over in 1919 onwards, you start to see pictures in the publications, including some quite elaborate paintings, showing a clean-shaven Jesus. Now, there's, there's a reason for this, which I'm going to get into, but let's just look at a questions from readers in the 1954 Watchtower. This is the August 15th issue, page 511 in the bound volumes, there's a question from MH, United States. The traditional picture of Jesus shows him with long hair and beard, but the Watchtower publications illustrate him as beardless and with short hair, which is correct. So 1954, this gets flagged by MH. I'm not going to read the whole article, but Let's just dip into it, shall we? The later Watchtower publications show Jesus as beardless and with short hair because he is shown that way in representations of him that are older than the traditional effeminate-looking picture. In an ancient beaker or cup found at Antioch, Syria, which purports to represent Jesus and his disciples at the memorial supper, Jesus is engraved thereon as a beardless young man, while some of his disciples are pictured with beards. For a photograph of this, see Harper's Bible Dictionary, page 22, in the midst of the article Antioch, the Chalice of. The scholarly book by Jack Finnegan, Light from the Ancient Past, tells of 2nd century Christian paintings found in the catacomb of Priscilla in the room Capella Greca and states... The painting of the resurrection of Lazarus is now almost effaced, but it is still possible to recognise that on one side is depicted a small building containing a mummy, and on the other, the sister of Lazarus standing with arms upraised. In the middle, Christ is shown, facing toward the tomb and with the right hand uplifted in a gesture of speech. He is represented in the Roman type and is dressed in tunic and pallium, the left hand holding the garment, he is youthful and beardless, with short hair and large eyes. The picture is of great interest, since it is the oldest representation of Jesus that is preserved anywhere. And I'm going to skip down to later on in the article, you'll have picked up where it starts off by saying that to wear a beard would be effeminate looking, or it hints in that direction. And then it says, since the Bible does not describe Jesus' facial appearance or indicate he had a beard of length, we follow the oldest archaeological evidence rather than the later traditional view that makes Jesus appear effeminate and sallow and sanctimonious. Isn't that interesting language to be using? So 1954... 
they are referring to depictions of Jesus wearing a beard as showing him to be effeminate. Apparently it's effeminate to wear a beard. I, I can't understand how that can possibly be. And sallow and sanctimonious. It's a prideful thing. You're, you're being sanctimonious. I, I'm laboring on this point because this is the sort of language you use when you want to control people. This is their way of saying, you know, quite apart from the issue of whether Jesus wore a beard or not, this is the language they are using regarding people who wear beards. But the point is, they weren't coming up with any good reasons <laughs> for depriving Jesus of his beard in this period in the organization's literature where Jesus appeared clean shaven all they could come up with was well someone found a cup <laughs> and on that cup Jesus didn't have a beard so we're going with that in 1968 the watchtower considered more reliable evidence from both historical sources and the scriptures none of the four gospels indicate that Jesus appearance stood out as different he did what was customary among Jewish men at that time. He wore a beard. Our videos and artwork in our publications ever since have consistently portrayed Jesus with a well-groomed beard. By the time the Christian congregation was established, the Romans had adopted the practice of shaving. Were Jewish Christians then expected to shave or were Gentile Christians expected to grow beards in order to blend in with their Jewish brothers? Evidently not, since the scriptures neither command true worshipers to grow a beard nor command them to shave, this was a matter of personal decision. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, beards were common even among the Bible students, as seen in these photos of pilgrim brothers who traveled for the organization. Brother Russell, too, wore a beard. One newspaper editor called him a well-groomed minister. He said, It had never occurred to me he was any different from thousands of other preachers. His soft, white flowing beard is the beard of a patriarch, a father. It gives you confidence. It gives you confidence. <laughs> a beard's going to give you confidence in what someone's saying. Always trust someone who wears a beard. I think is the message there. But yeah, that that last quotation from an unnamed newspaper editor about Russell looking patriarchal was very interesting. He looks like a father. He wasn't a father. He, he didn't have any children. So it, it's odd that they're making that connection. But you'll notice as well, they said... In, from the late 19th to early 20th centuries, it was common for Bible students, which was the name of the group that would later become, you could argue, Jehovah's Witnesses. It was common for Bible students to have beards. When they say early 20th century, what they mean is up until when Rutherford took over, which was in 1919, and from that point onwards... That was when the organization started to clamp down on bids. I'm going to come to why very shortly, but let's just go back to that 1968 Watchtower questions from readers that they quote from, or they don't quote from it actually, which is irritating. They just show it briefly on the screen. I guess if you're feeling quite studious as a Jehovah's Witness, you might want to look it up. But for the most part, I think the audience will just kind of gloss over this and think, okay, well, you know, they're crossing the T's and dotting the I's. They're showing us, you know, the history of <laughs> beards in the organization. They're not necessarily going to look this up, but let's look it up. And let's just read uh, from the beginning or, or the, the, the beginning paragraph. So the, the title or the question is when Jesus Christ was a man on earth, did he wear a beard from KA USA? Biblical evidence 
is the most reliable testimony to be found on this question. And a recent careful review of what it says indicates that Jesus did indeed have a beard. So we're not going with the cup thing anymore. <laughs> We've chucked away the cup. That's no longer permissible as evidence. Neither are those pictures in the catacombs that we were referring to. We've decided that that doesn't count anymore. We've had a recent careful review of the Bible. As though they weren't supposed to be carefully reviewing the Bible to begin with when they started depicting Jesus without a beard, which is quite a big deal, I think we can agree. It's quite a bold move <laughs> to consistently, over many years, depict Jesus without a beard. Why couldn't they undertake a careful review of what it says in the Bible before they started making all these depictions of Jesus beardless. But anyway, Jesus, born a Jew, going back to the article, came to be under law and he fulfilled the law. This was in order that he might pave the way for the abolishing of the law and for release of the Jews from the curse of the law, the condemnation of death that it brought against them. Like all other Jews, Jesus was under obligation to keep the whole law. One of the commandments of the law was, you must not cut your side locks short around, and you must not destroy the extremity of your beard. So we've decided that Jesus did have a beard, because it's kind of obvious that <laughs> if he was Jewish and looked upon with some degree of respect as a Jewish leader, of course he would have had a beard. You know, it would have been a massive controversy if, if he hadn't had a beard, or he certainly would have found it very difficult to develop any kind of gathering back in those times without a beard. They go from a half-baked explanation for depicting Jesus without a beard that involves a cup... <laughs> And they go to saying, well, actually, it's kind of obvious that Jesus would have had a beard. So, oops, you know, we're going to start showing Jesus with a beard. I think we need to answer the question. And I've already done this in a previous video. Uh, here's a thumbnail if you want to check it. But I've, I've dealt with this already extensively. And I'm going to try and summarize this as briefly as possible we need to discuss the real reason, because the reasoning that you've just been given in this Governing Body Update video is just a lie. It's just a total fabrication, a whitewashing of history. If you want to know why beards were banned under the presidency of Joseph Rutherford, all you really need is a copy of this book, 30 Years a Watchtower Slave, Here's my personal copy. It's by William J. Schnell, who I think will have passed away quite some time ago because this was published. Um, let me see. It was first published in 1956. So this is quite an old book, um, albeit this is a, a like a newly printed copy of it. Let's go to page 51. An amusing incident took place at the time of the judge's visit. William Schnell, I should mention, was at this time a Bethelite at the German branch of the Bible students or Jehovah's Witnesses. The director of our German branch, as had many before him, had grown a large beard patterned after Charles T. Russell's beard. The judge did not want anything at all to remain which might remind him of Russell, not even the cultivation of a beard. So sitting at the table for dinner one night, within my earshot, the director asked the judge for one more large rotary press. The judge said nothing for a while, merely ate. Then suddenly he looked up, his eyes pinned severely on the director's huge beard and said, I will buy you the press if you take that thing off pointing to the beard. It surely shocked the director's sensibilities, but he meekly heeded the warning 
and soon shamefacedly appeared minus his beard. That's why Jehovah's Witnesses for so long weren't allowed beards. That's why Jesus was depicted without a beard. It was all to do with Joseph Rutherford, who the more we delve into this character from Jehovah's Witness history, the more we learn was simply a megalomaniac. He was a total narcissist. He took over from Russell in 1919 and completely reinvented the religion in his image to reflect his personal opinions and his personal views. And his personal opinions and personal views were actually quite shocking, as I've touched upon in many, many videos, but we won't go into that. This was all about power, control, and one man's personal vendetta against his predecessor, who, among other things, was known for his patriarchal beard. Rutherford wanted nothing that would remind him, apparently, of Russell, and that's why beards were banned. Soon after World War I, shaving enjoyed a resurgence in popularity. In 1919, when this photo of the pilgrims was taken, most did not have a beard. Therefore, although our publication said little about the subject at the time, very few brothers grew beards. Starting in the 1960s, in many lands, beards became associated with those who were rebelling against established authority. Where that was the case, most men, both witnesses and non-witnesses, chose to shave. Because of the negative connotations associated with wearing a beard, most brothers who wore a beard did not serve as ministerial servants, elders, or in other appointed positions. With the passing of time, in some lands, beards became more common and were not associated with rebellion. In those places, some brothers with beards were appointed as ministerial servants and elders. In recent times, the wearing of a beard has become common in many more lands. So how should we view a brother who chooses to grow a beard today? The video ended with an intriguing question. How should we view a brother who chooses to grow a beard today? The governing body has asked me to read the following announcement. Which we will get to. But yes, that is an intriguing question. How should we view a brother, a Jehovah's Witness, who chooses to wear a beard today? It's intriguing not for the reasons he would suggest. It's intriguing because it gets straight to the heart of the matter in exposing just how controlling this organization is. For that even to be a question a serious question for which, you know, time needs to be allocated on the JW Broadcasting studio space. I mean, how should we view someone? What should be our opinion? What, how should we feel? What should, what should our thoughts be on someone who chooses to wear a beard? That's the question that should be vexing us. <laughs> As I explained, they have long been image obsessed, obsessed with appearance. And they are now, it seems, waking up to this realization that it's not a good look to be policing the way people grow their facial hair. It, it's, it's just obviously a culty thing to do, to say, you know what, you are less impressive as a human being or your character must be somehow deficient because look look at the way that you've allowed your hair follicles on your face to grow it's just so obviously wrong and and yet here they are having to do this awkward embarrassing u-turn and so they have to do it by means of this question which then prompts the announcement but just think again, if you're watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, think about the language that's used there. Negative connotations. Because of the negative connotations associated with wearing a beard, 
Most brothers who wore a beard did not serve as ministerial servants, elders, or in other appointed positions. This was basically the reason that I grew up with when I was being raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, when I inevitably, inevitably had the question, Mum and Dad, you know, what's, what is it with the beards, you know? <laughs> Why? You know, what? why is it that men apparently aren't allowed to have beards if they want to be used as elders and ministerial servants? And this was the answer I was given. Oh, it's basically to do with the hippie movement. It's basically to do with what happened during the 60s and 70s and the fact that if you wore a beard it said something about you as a person it said that you were a bit of a rebel we don't want to be perceived as rebels we don't like the negative connotations and i i should have thought about this more i obviously didn't when i was a child but what does it say about any religion that claims to be bible based if it is obsessed with or worried about negative connotations. Since when do negative connotations mean that you need to jump through hoops to stop people from doing something that's perfectly natural? Shouldn't it be not about negative connotations, not about public opinion, not about what's culturally acceptable or unacceptable, shouldn't it be purely about what's in the Bible. A number of branch offices around the world have written to us indicating that there continue to be questions about whether or not it is proper for a brother in an appointed position to wear a beard. After prayerful consideration, the governing body has concluded that there is a need to clarify this matter. The governing body does not have an issue with brothers wearing beards. Why not? Because the scriptures do not condemn the wearing of beards. Furthermore, as time has passed, we have noted that in many lands, it is acceptable for men who hold responsible positions in business and government to wear beards. Thus, whether a brother wears a beard is a personal decision. A brother's qualifications to serve as an elder or ministerial servant are based on his spirituality, not on whether he chooses to wear a beard. This direction also applies to special full-time servants at Bethel and those in the field, including special pioneers, missionaries, and circuit overseers. In harmony with Romans 14.4, neither the elders nor any other Christian should feel compelled to judge a brother who chooses to wear a beard. We trust that these comments will help us to remain on guard against anything that might cause division among Jehovah's people. End of the announcement from the governing body. End of the announcement. I love that. It's not, we take this opportunity to send our warm and heartfelt love to all of you dear brothers. It's just end of announcement. <laughs> We're dealing with this. Actually, we've dealt with it. We don't want anything to cause any division, which is really another way of saying we're just tired of dealing with this particular issue. <laughs> we we have enough fires to put out with the child abuse, with the shunning, with blood transfusions, you know, with higher education. We, we've got enough issues to deal with right now <laughs> to, to be receiving letters asking us why on earth we're not going to let people wear beards. So here's our transmission. Here's our decision over and out. It's, I love the terseness of it. It, says every, it speaks to, for me, an organization in panic mode. They are 
realizing, I think, due in part to the newer members coming in, they're realizing that some aspects of the toxic Jehovah's Witness brand are easily fixable or more easily fixable than others. With blood transfusions, it's not like you can just do a U-turn without taking some accountability for all of the people who've died refusing blood. You know, there's a cost attached to a U-turn in that area of the teachings. But when it comes to something like beards, where the Bible is not just silent, but arguably very pro-beard, <laughs> you know, what do they have to lose? It, you know, if anything, they gain by making the organization in this one area at least a little bit less controlling but the i guess the the one problem that they do have and it's blatantly obvious here is that just by acknowledging the beard rule just by acknowledging that they were restricting people over all of these decades and encouraging a culture in which men with beards were looked down upon they are opening this Pandora's box for those who will really think about this, and I hope there will be many. They're opening up a number of questions about how man-made all of this is. Again, why isn't it enough to just go off what's in the Bible? Why have anything approaching a beard rule? Isn't that precisely what they criticize other religions for. Isn't that the sort of thing that they criticize, for example, the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day for doing, for creating rules that had no actual scriptural basis? I love the language earlier on in the announcement, after prayerful consideration. My question to the governing body would be, how has this not already had prayerful consideration? You know, the governing body or the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever was apparently appointed in 1919, and it's taken you this long to give this particular subject prayerful consideration? Really? And I also find it fascinating when in the announcement it says, the governing body does not have an issue with someone wearing a beard or words to that effect. They can't say God doesn't have an issue. They can't say the Bible doesn't have an issue. They can't say Jesus doesn't have an issue. They're just cutting right to the chase. It's not about God, Jesus, the Bible. It's not about any real divine authority. It's purely about them. It's purely about the power and control and opinions of the governing body members. This direction, however may raise some questions. For example, here's one. Why is the governing body providing this direction at this time? Well, as recorded at 1 Corinthians 7.31, the Apostle Paul was inspired to write, The scene of this world is changing. The study note in that verse shows that Paul may have been alluding to the way that scenes changed swiftly in a theater, with actors passing quickly on and off the stage. In keeping with the principle of Paul's inspired statement, grooming styles have changed over the years. For example, more and more beards are worn by men in responsible positions who project a respectable appearance. Here's another question. How should we view a brother who decides to grow a beard? Well, we should apply Jesus' counsel found at John 7, 24, stop judging by the outward appearance. As we saw in the video, grooming styles have changed over time. Not all of such changes are bad. To illustrate, none of us would likely choose to dress and groom ourselves as people did in Bible times, nor even as people did 
a century ago. In fact, most choose to follow the styles that are prevalent now, not those from decades past. Generally speaking, it's not bad or wrong to dress and groom ourselves as people in our community commonly do, as long as that style does not violate Bible principles. We always want to be sure that our appearance reflects cleanliness, modesty, and soundness of mind. What a U-turn this is proving to be. Again, so many issues here, and I, I really hope that this will get the cogs whirring among Jehovah's Witnesses who watch this. He quotes from 1 Corinthians seven thirty one: the scene of this world is changing in giving justification for this U-turn on beards. I mean, aren't you a little bit behind the curve on this? I mean, if we're, ref if we're referencing the hippie movement of the 60s and 70s, I mean, it's now at the end of 2023, entering 2024, and you're only now acknowledging that beards aren't necessarily associated with rebellion and with free love and with smoking weed. <laughs> you're only just acknowledging that now. Not in the 1980s, not in the 1990s. It, you have to wait this long to figure this out. What does this say about this being God's organization that's you know, really got their finger on the button? And the other verse that is quoted is also very telling. Stop judging by the outward appearance, John 7, 24. Well, hey, <laughs> you're the ones quoting this verse in relation to your own rule and your own culture of doing things. You have just applied the words of Jesus to yourselves. It's not me doing it. You know, I'm not the one that's plugging this Bible verse out. You've essentially, you being the governing body, you, you know, you have identified a very, very toxic atmosphere and, and culture within the organization of judging by the outward appearance. And you have applied that particular verse, these words of Jesus, to your own organization and the way your organization over which you presided did things for decades. Then we have Stephen saying, Generally speaking, it's not bad or wrong to dress and groom ourselves as people in our community commonly do. I mean, if it's what other people in the community are doing, generally speaking, I guess it's okay. <laughs> That's apparently the way Jehovah's Witnesses should think. Only clearly it isn't. <laughs> clearly, the worldly way of doing things is wrong from almost every angle. And you shouldn't just copy what other people in your community are doing, generally speaking. This is not the religion I grew up in. I'm sorry, how, how can you say this? while at the same time clamping down on tight pants. <laughs> I mean, I know Tony's no longer with us as a governing body member, but come on, that, that wasn't so long ago, that whole tight pants thing, where you weren't allowed to go preaching if your pants were too tight. We also had uh, ripped jeans denounced in the last convention. And yet, generally speaking, if it's what your local community are doing, it's okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. I wish this were genuine. I wish this were really what life as a Jehovah's Witness were like. But anyone who spent any time as a Jehovah's Witness knows that the reality is very, very different from how Stephen Lett is now suddenly portraying the Jehovah's Witness religion. Here's another question. How can we promote unity in light of this direction? Well, after viewing this program, 
some might have to contend with strong feelings. For example, some might feel as though they've been vindicated, saying, in effect, this is what I've been saying for a long time. This proves that I was right all along. Others might feel disappointed, saying, in effect, I supported the policy about grooming for all those years. Now, I feel let down. But is either reaction appropriate? Not really. Note what the Apostle Paul was inspired to write at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 10. Now I urge you, brothers, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you should all speak in agreement, and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you may be completely united in the same mind and in the same line of thought. How does that principle apply here? Well, if we've been promoting our own opinion on this subject, contradicting the guidance from the organization, have we been promoting unity? Have we helped the brotherhood to be completely united in the same line of thought? Clearly not. Any who've done so need to adjust their thinking and attitude. On the other hand, if we've loyally supported the organization's direction over the years, do we have any scriptural reason to regret our course? Certainly not. Jehovah values our loyal service. He also appreciates our humble willingness to be obedient and submissive to the direction we receive from God's organization. So what we're now getting is the debrief. Jehovah's Witnesses are being told, having received this bombshell news, hey, you have autonomy now in deciding for yourselves whether you have facial hair, if you're able to grow facial hair, you can decide for yourselves. They're now being told how to feel about this news. They're being told how to think. Again, this is a banquet of examples of how culty and controlling this organization is. They can't just do a U-turn. They can't just say, you know what? We made a mistake. Sorry about that. We should have realized this sooner. We, we understand. We, we accept that this was an unbiblical policy, an unbiblical rule. We accept that. And now we're putting it right, and we'd like to apologize if we've made anyone feel bad or caused any undue harm or distress to people during the decades when this policy was in force. They can't just be humble, can they, and make that sort of admission. They've got to say, okay, things are changing, over and out, deal with it. And when we say deal with it, we want you to deal with it in the way that we tell you. You're not allowed to feel proud or vindicated if you previously agreed with the position that we have only now reached. <laughs> if you were previously against our no beard rule and just went along with it because you had to, don't you dare start feeling proud and vindicated now. Those feelings are forbidden. We, we forbid those thoughts in your brain. And the same goes for if you're feeling bad because you supported us and now we're abandoning you. You, you don't get to feel resentment either way. Just, just be happy. Think happy, th think happy thoughts and everything's going to be great. Back in the first century CE, some Christians allowed the issue of circumcision to cause division. But the Holy Spirit directed 
the governing body, to resolve that issue and promote unity. Fact check. No, that's wrong. That's a lie. The Bible doesn't use the phrase or term governing body. What Stephen Lett just told you there is revisionism, you know, to put it mildly. When the circumcision issue came up, it was decided upon by the apostles and older men. The older men included a variety of individuals who didn't, as far as we know, repeatedly meet to form a governing body. So what Stephen Let's just said here in trying to cover the organization's backside isn't accurate. There were certainly issues that the first century Christians contended with surrounding circumcision, but they weren't dealt with by a governing body. Governing body is a corporate term. It's not a spiritual or scriptural term. Similarly, the governing body today is striving to promote unity. We would never want the matter of beards to cause division among us. All of us need to remember that the earthly part of Jehovah's organization is always striving to reflect the heavenly part, to keep up with it, as it were. Remember how fast the chariot in Ezekiel's vision moved? Like flashes of lightning. Any who seek to run ahead of that chariot, trying to force change prematurely, or who lag behind, hesitating to support changes that have come from the faithful slave, are not keeping pace with Jehovah's organization. In conclusion, are we not grateful for this balanced direction regarding beards? Jehovah has dignified us. He allows each brother the freedom to choose whether or not he will wear a beard. We're confident that all of you are determined to keep pace, adjust your views as needed, and continue to serve Jehovah loyally, promoting love and unity among your brothers and sisters. From the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, this is JW Broadcasting. So yes, that's the GB update number eight for 2023. That's the beard announcement. And apparently Jehovah's Witnesses are to feel gratitude. They're to be thankful. As I joked at the beginning of this video with my whole little you're welcome thing. Isn't that the attitude that's being projected? You should thank us. You know, you should thank us because we're giving you this new freedom. We're, we're unlocking this privilege that gives men or those who can grow beards the dignity to make their own decisions about their facial hair. Jehovah has dignified us is what Stephen Letts said there. Again, what does that say about the status quo before this U-turn? Right up until the 15th of December 2023, was Jehovah not dignifying us? You know, was Jehovah's organization depriving us or depriving Jehovah's Witnesses of their dignity? by removing such a basic freedom, the basic freedom of deciding whether you grow your facial hair or not? I think that's a, a question that's worth drilling down on, but it's all just glossed over. It's just a case of, hey, we've made this decision, announcement over, let's all be happy, no negative thoughts, you should all be grateful, we've given you this freedom, you can thank us later, and now we're going to give you some of your dignity back. We've decided in our graciousness, as the faithful and discreet slave, that Jehovah's celestial organization, which moves at lightning speed, has moved in this particular direction 
on the topic of beards. It's gone at this beard-related tangent. So we followed it at lightning speed. And, and you need to follow us too, or you're not keeping pace with Jehovah's Organization. It's your fault. If, if, you, if you have any negative thoughts, if you don't thank us for this, if you're not feeling gratitude in your heart at what we've done for you here, then the problem is with you. The problem is that you're simply not keeping pace with Jehovah's Organization. Again, <laughs> what more do you need? to prove how cult-like Jehovah's Witnesses are as an organization. I'm, I continue to be grateful. And for the record, as I've already announced on this channel, I'm not doing long-form rebuttals anymore. This is about as long, uh, you know, what I'm doing today as I can muster. I did just feel, though, that this was a special opportunity uh, to highlight, again, how controlling the organization is. And so I've jumped on it as quickly as I can, not as quickly as some of you would have liked. I realise that, but I'm doing things at my own pace now. And I did feel that this was an important topic to discuss. Jehovah's Witnesses watching this, ask yourselves the question, does this really speak to a divinely directed organisation? One minute they're depicting Jesus without a beard because of a cup when really it was to do with Rutherford. The next thing, the beard is back because they're acknowledging that the Bible doesn't describe Jesus as being clean-shaven. And now they're coming up with this U-turn and not only are they acknowledging that the organisation was obsessed with appearance or overly obsessed with appearance, they're also expecting you to feel a certain way about it. They're also telling you what you should think, how you should feel, what your thoughts should be, and how grateful you should be. So I hope that this video has given you some food for thought, but that's all I have for you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.